Hello, welcome everybody. Today, we are very excited for Musicians Roundtable to have as a guest the renowned Italian guitar virtuoso, Andrea Tiechi. And we are gonna specialize our discussion today in the works of Via Lobos. Andrea has recorded the complete solo works of Via Lobos, and I'm really looking forward to uh, our discussion. So Andrea, how are you today? Hi, Jeffrey. I'm fine, thanks. Good. So one of the things I wanted to ask you was how you, first of all, how you initially got interested in music and what led you to begin playing the guitar? When I was a child, my father used to listen to classical music, especially during the weekends. Uh, he had some uh, records of classical music, uh, mostly um, symphonic works like uh, the Beethoven symphonies, the Tchaikovsky or Vivaldi, Four Seasons, you know, the popular classics. And I used to like it a lot. And then there was a, a friend in, a friend of my parents that used to play guitar, just a few chords and a few tunes, was not a professional player. Uh, I was so fascinated by the tone of the instrument that by the time I was uh, 10 years old, I, I asked my parents if they could buy a guitar for my birthday, as a birthday, pre birthday present. So that was the start of everything. And then the next year I started learning guitar. At first it was a chord practice. You know, I used to play with a plectrum, uh, folk music. And then the, after a few months, I started learning the classical style. Fantastic. So for me always, Via Lobos has been one of the composers that I've absolutely loved to play my whole life. And can you talk a little bit about how you first experienced Fio Lobos, both in terms of listening and which music of his you began to play? Yes, I remember that when I was uh, in my first years of, uh, of study, uh, one of the first recordings I happened to, to listen to was Julian Bream's recording of the 12 studies and the Brazilian suite. And that was a shock to me. Uh, I really I felt in love with that music, and uh, at once I f I felt that was something I wanted to to play someday. So uh, at that time I was learning easy pieces like the Carulli, Giuliani studies, that kind of stuff. But I found uh, the, the the score of the Villa Lobos Preludes, and I started to 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 learn them by myself. I just wanted to, to 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 learn something by this composer. Of course, by the time I I had heard the the, the prelude as well, and uh, so I started playing Villa Lobos pieces very early. And uh, when I was about thirteen years old, I could already play three or four preludes and a couple of studies and the whole suite. So I started very, very early. Of course, uh, those were not very mature performances, but I, I had great fun. Uh, of course, uh, with the time, uh, I learned all the pieces that Villa Lobos wrote for the guitar. And uh, my feeling was that this was great music. Uh, by any standard, I mean, some of the best music I could I could really think of on the classical guitar. And uh, well, now I've been playing these pieces for over 30 years. Uh, my, my feeling is that it's music that is very, is very close to my personality. And uh, I never get tired of these pieces and of this composer. I have. I've found that it's my belief that Villalobos had 
not only the great genius as a composer, but he had a true genius for composing with the guitar and for the guitar. And yes. although we have endless number of compositions from so many talented composers, I think almost no one has really heard and realized the potentials of the guitar in such a deep way as Villalobos. I agree. I absolutely agree. Uh, Villalobos used to play the guitar. He used to play uh, Brazilian music, traditional Brazilian music in the choros, which were groups of players that were performing in Rio de Janeiro at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, he used to play as a choro performer till the age of 30. So eventually he became a very experienced player, even if he didn't go on by performing and he, he never became a professional performer. But his knowledge of the guitar was very deep. And at the same time, he was a self-taught. So he was not conditioned by any uh, precept from any school. So we know that he, he knew the classical masters like Sor, Carulli, Giuliani, Carcassi, and Aguado. So he had the knowledge of the classical uh, schools, but he was not influenced, for instance, by the Segovia school or the Tarrega school. Uh, he used to, to play with the little finger of the right hand. Uh, and there are some hints in his uh, music about this. For instance, the arpeggio pattern in prelude number two. It can be very easily played with five fingers, not so easily with four. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, it was kind of free and very open-minded about the guitar. But at the same time, he knew the guitar very well. I think this is the reason why he wrote such beautiful music and such uh, new music uh, for the guitar. His, uh, his vocabulary is completely new compared to other pieces by guitarists, composers of the time. Yes. I think let's proceed now and get into the three main uh, collections of his music beginning with the 12 etudes. And something that I had not realized, but that you shared with me earlier, is that you have discovered a structure and harmonic scheme of, uh, of the 12 etudes. And so what I'm going to do is to put up your schematic diagram, and perhaps you can take us on a tour of, um, of the overall scheme, and then from there we'll look at uh, etude number one, uh, and we'll we'll go from there. So I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going for for our listeners, for our listeners and our viewers, the technology we're using is called Google Hangouts, and when it works, it's nothing short of spectacular, and when it doesn't work, or if I make a mistake. It, it, it gets difficult, and so please bear with us. So we're gonna begin with what's called screen share, and I'm gonna select the, um, the diagram. So are you able to see this, yes. Andrea? Yes. And for, for our viewers, uh, thank you, hopefully, that you can bear with us through the technological issues. Please please go ahead and uh, if you could speak about the scheme. Yes. Well, when I started performing the 12 studies in, in concerts, I re immediately realized that they sounded as a whole. I mean, there is a sense of togetherness in those pieces, if you play them as a whole. Uh, and I, I wanted to, to, to see if there was a reason 
behind these. So I try to analyze the, the tonalities of the different studies and to, to see the, the arrangement of the pieces in this big cycle. Uh, the first thing that you can observe is that the whole cycle can be divided in two parts. Uh, and this has to do with the style of the pieces. The first five, uh, the first six uh, studies, sorry, uh, they are in perpetual motion character. And so those are kind of a little cycle in themselves. And then the second part of the cycle from study number seven to study number 12, those are the, the big concert studies. So we have wider pieces which are more developed and which employ different techniques. And this has to do with the, the character of the cycle. But then if we look more closely, we will see that there is a tonal relationship between the first half of the cycle and the second half. Because all the major keys in the first half find their relative minor key in the second half, with the only exception of uh, studies number seven and number eight, which are in direct relationship, major and related minor. And also, if we look at the intervals between each study and the, and the next one, we will see that it's basically uh, a sequence of fifths with third, third intervals in the middle. So it's a symmetrical arrangement of keys. And this is very clever because in this way, Villa Lobos could have a tonal variety without using bad keys for the guitar. I mean, we have only guitar friendly keys here, which means keys with no more than four sharps, I would say. And we don't have, basically, we have very little use of the flat keys. And this shows how Villa Lobos knew the guitar. He knew the guitar very deeply. And so he managed to, to arrange the, the 12 studies in such a way as to have a, a lot of tonal variety, but always employing the best keys for the guitar. And I think it's quite clear from this scheme that this can't, cannot happen by chance. This was very carefully planned. And uh, this is the reason why when you hear the studies played uh, all together, one after the other, you get this deep sense of togetherness because there is a plan behind this. Yes. So I think that the plane of all 12 together and with the concept of a whole is something that really is has not, had not been done very often. There have been guitarists who've done all 12, but I think that that's there's one thing to have the sequence, but there's another th there's another approach which you're discussing that has an overview of everything. And that's that makes it remarkable. Um, now, I'd like to proceed from here to looking at just one of his uh, one of his pieces, and the etude number one, which is so um, so popular with everybody, is one that has its own history as far as versions and manuscripts, and so. I am going to do another screen share. And what we're going to be looking at is in V. Lobos' own handwriting. The original manuscript. I'm going to do a bit of a close up of the beginning so everybody can see this. But it is wonderful 
I might just say that, and Andrea can discuss this, interesting that he used the word prelude and that the word anime for the tempo is there. So, Andrea, can you comment a bit on this manuscript and how it is related to the, for example, the, the publication by Eshik in the 50s that published everything of these etudes? Well, actually, I think uh, it's not strictly related to the 1953 edition, because for that edition, Villa Lobos had a new, different manuscript prepared by his wife. This manuscript from 1928 was a fair copy that was probably intended for, for publishing purposes, but it remained unpublished. And when eventually Villa Lobos decided to publish these pieces in the 50s, he changed many details in several pieces and he had the new manuscript prepared. So we should consider these as an uh, earlier version of the study. It's not the original version. This is a mistake. Uh, there are other manuscripts for uh, the studies and uh, we should know the, the story of these pieces very carefully in order not to make mistakes because for some years uh, when this 1928 manuscript came out some players said this was the original the only true original version but actually uh, this is not the truth this is one version and then Villa Lobos reworked the pieces uh, when he decided to publish them and in recent times Frederick Zigante uh, published the new critical edition where he explains the story and uh, he found out this uh, new manuscript that was prepared by Villa Lobos wife and this manuscript was uh, in the Segovia's papers at Segovia's house. So there are some differences, as you said. Uh, the word prelude, which is not in the edition, but we know that usually the first piece in a study cycles uh, has the character of a prelude. And this is true also for, uh, for instance, for Chopin's prelude, uh, studies for the piano, Opus 10 and Opus 25. Um, so it was a quite a common practice uh, to, to, to have the first study in the, in the style of the prelude. And here there are no repeats in, the, in, in each bar. In the edition we find repeats, but there is another manuscript which is uh, older than this one, which has the repeats. So probably Villa Lobos changed the, his mind quite a few times about this. And, uh, finally, he decided to, to, to have the repeats in the edition. Yes. Then the, 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 the character, anime. In the published edition, uh, the word anime is used only in the second half of the cycle. In the first half, we have different uh, indications like allegro, allegro moderato, allegro non troppo. Uh, moderato, andantino, but we don't find the word anime. So probably he decided to, to, to mark the difference in character between the first six studies, uh, which are more, in a way, more technical. Then uh, they have a kind of perpetual motion character, as I told you before. Uh, to mark the difference between these six pieces and the second half of the cycle, which is made up of true, big and developed concert pieces with more character, with more uh, uh, intensity. That's why the word anime is used. And then we can see that the, the fingering, the fingering is, is exactly the same as we see in the edition. And it's Villa Lobos original fingering, except that in the edition we have no left hand fingering, only the right hand. Yes. And uh, yeah. it's a very clever fingering, of course. Mm, the, the arpeggio pattern is based on a 
two nodes cell, but the right hand fingering is not based on two fingers only. Uh, it makes use of the four fingers. So uh, you should aim to get uh, evenness, but at the same time, I think Villa Lobos didn't want a kind of a machine like effect. He wanted a, something different, probably something more, I would say, nebulous, some more impressionistic uh, effect to this wow. music. I, th I think if we now go to the 1953 published edition and look at the first page, we can see the repeats of the measures and all these many things that you discussed. Yes. I wanted to suggest to the people who are listening, uh, there is a, and I'm, I'm not sure, I have to say, I'm not sure exactly how this works, but if you people have access to screen showcase, you can see that I've posted here a um, beautiful video performance of Andrea playing this etude number one. These links will be included in the video and in other places for people who are interested. I was very interested in several aspects of Andrea's performance, and I was just going to say, uh, what is very interesting to me is how you approach the bass notes, particularly in the opening, which have the repeated low E's, and then proceed chromatically up to the B at the uh, Bardi minor chord in the seventh position. And there is a sense of crescendo and certainly of melodic aspect to that bass line. I don't always hear this in other people's performances. So, and then the other, uh, the other thing I was going to mention is that in the second uh, page of it, where the guitar is shifting gradually from the 10th fret back, there's a descending diminished seventh chord. And in it, Andrea, if when you listen to it, you see there's a beautiful terrace decrescendo. In this case, Via Lobos has virtually almost nothing in terms of dynamic marking except this at the beginning. And so I think he's my sense and see, so I want to ask Andrea, how do you approach dynamics and phrasing in this music, which is almost without indicators? Well, first of all, the, the P that we see in the first bar of the edition is very likely to be a misprint. It's, the, it's a fingering indication that was uh, uh, misunderstood by the engravers, and so it became a P of a piano, but it's actually the first uh, uh, indication of the right hand fingering, so it's thumb of the right hand, uh, which means that <clears throat> there are no dynamic indications in the edition. In these cases, what I do is to, to try to get the, the harmonic sense of the piece and try to, 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 to decide the dynamics according to the harmonic tensions. And my feeling is that the first part is searching for the dominant chord. And uh, this rise of the bass um, suggested that I could play a crescendo there till the dominant chord. And then we have a sudden surprise with a diminished seventh chord, uh, which is used together with E open strings and shifting gradually. And so the, the, this chord, I feel it very loud because it's really something kind of shocking. It's not what you would expect there. You would expect uh, resolution, an uh, E minor chord. And this way I can 
I can go down with the dynamics as well. I mean, if you if you start loud and you have a, a long shift downwards, then you can you can follow this movement of the lines with a very slow and gradual uh, diminuendo until you get to the final part of the piece where the E minor key is reached, and then you have a uh, the final section of the piece, which is basically very similar to the first uh, part of the piece. I mean, Villa Lobos is once again looking for the dominant chord, but this time we have the resolution. And so we have the last uh, bars uh, with the E minor ending and the beautiful harmonics. Uh, uh, in a way, this is what he was looking for. Uh, for the whole piece. So that's my idea and my dynamics um, try to, to, to describe this kind of path. That is, I think that now uh, when people take a few moments to listen to the recording that Andrea has done, you'll see an absolutely fantastic realization of all these ideas. It tells me also that there's nothing accidental about a very fine performance from anybody on anything. And so there's so much scholarship here that also goes into it and judgment and exploration. It's a great thing. Now, let's move forward to the discussion of the five preludes. And we're gonna look a little bit at Prelude number one, and I've brought up here, I will expand it a little bit. I brought up here a compositional sketch that shows a very first version of the beginning theme of prelude number one, and also a first version of the middle section in E major. So Andrea, could you discuss what you think about these for a moment? Yes, this is a kind of a early sketch of prelude number one. And we see that it has a very clear waltz character. Um, and the accompaniment is very simple. It's a kind of a, I would say, primitive idea of what eventually became prelude number one. And also the, the, the central section looks quite different. The, the rhythm is completely different. And in this early version, um, sounds like a kind of a improvisation. Uh, in a way, it's not so, 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 so clear. And the rhythm is quite uh, uncertain. Uh, we have a group of six notes, then we have a triplet on two. Uh, so it's quite uneven. In the edition, we have a, a more dance-like character, which basically is based on a 5-4 meter. And the, the, the beginning also is very interesting, because the way Villa Lobos transforms this uh, idea is really, I think it's genial, because the bass, which has typical cello-like character. The bass keeps moving uh, with a kind of uh, waltz character, but the accompaniment, <laughs> that's in 6-8. It's a hemiola pattern, uh, which in a way is a little contrast in terms of rhythm with the, with the plain character of the melody. I think this is a cue of what we should do in performing this piece, because he says andantino espressivo, but at the same time, it has a very precise rhythmical character. My feeling is that it shouldn't be too rubato. It should be played more in tempo, and it should be espressivo in the, in the way you sing the line. We should not forget the, that Villalobos was a, a cello player, 
and here we see that he's he's making the guitar sound like a, and sing like a cello so when i play this piece i try to 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 be quite i wouldn't say precise because you have to play with sensitiveness and uh, with expression but i don't like to play too freely because i like to hear the contrast between the 3 4 and 6 8 in the accompaniment and you cannot hear it if each bar is played with a lot of rubato isn't there also the aspect of an interpretation that this opening theme which is expanded with each repetition occurs not two times but three times, three times. and so a very rubato performance has nowhere to go if it starts off with a lot of rhythmic uh, freedom aside from missing the, that essential compositional element of really two meters simultaneously that give it such fantastic energy and and forward motion but exactly. with the with the beautiful waltz melody in the bass it's really a spectacular piece i agree with you uh, villa lobos builds up the tension very gradually each time the theme is repeated it's shorter but it gets higher uh, first time it gets to D, the second time to E, and the third time to F sharp on the fourth string. So there is an increase in tension. Uh, if we start uh, performing this prelude with too much emphasis, I think uh, we miss the point. I think there's an additional point of evidence that I would ask you to discuss, which is that in the whole very first section, there isn't a lot of tempo variation. But if you look at the third repetition that I've posted here, you can yes. see that he has a great deal of poco allargando, exactly. uh, a tempo, retard, retardando, rallentando. And if he had wanted this, this would be my argument, in the beginning, he would have put it there. This would not have nearly the interpretive uh, effect if the whole thing has been done in that way. And then when you get here, what can a player uh, do at this point? Yeah. I couldn't agree more with you, Jeffrey. And uh, strangely, this part is very rarely performed with the required rubato. <laughs> For instance, after the fermata, uh, usually the a tempo and the rallentando markings, they're never played this way. Usually the other way around, uh, rubato the first bar and uh, then in tempo the second. But Villalobos was very clear here about what he wanted. Yes, and so then this rubato tempo that he'd articulated then will transition to the piomoso section which then being in two four time has a very rhythmical character with all the accents so i'm wondering if you could discuss how you conceive of this middle section and how you generate contrast and continuity in in your approach to your interpretation of this well this is a big contrast with what we had before um, once again i like to play in tempo here i don't like to play too freely especially the the arpeggiation at the the first bar of this section i think it should be played quite strictly in time not too fast, not rushing, not too rubato, because once again we have a dance character here coming out, especially from the bass, where Villalobos writes the, the accents, but also in the upper line, which has a very cheerful character, and uh, we have ornaments, uh, we have a little 
portamento in bar uh, in the second bar in the three four bar which is very rarely considered by guitarists i tr i try to 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 give importance to all these details because i think here villa lobos was trying to imitate the style of the choro playing especially if you think about the, the wind instrument way of playing popular music they usually put this kind of ornaments some kind of uh, uh, glissato between the notes and this is what villa lobos was trying to to imitate here it's kind of a hint to uh, brazilian popular music i mean the, the music that was played uh, by the choros choro groups when you in the piumosa section in the second measure which has the three four time you were just referring to the portamento between yes. the d, the g sharp down to the e yes. do you glissando your first finger back and release it yes. as an open string is that I how do you do glissando, but I play the second note, I play the E. So it's more a portamento than a glissando. And Villa Lobos yes. used to write the two different uh, effects in different ways. When he wanted the glissando, usually he put also a, a slur, slur and line. Yes. Um, so the idea, we, we have something like this also at the beginning of the Schottisch Choro from the suite. Uh, it's a way to connect the notes, which is not a slur, uh, something different. It's, well, we call it portamento, and I think that's the way it should be played. And usually it's played like a slur. I mean, it's not a big thing, but I think you wanted something different here. Then, in the same couple of measures, I think that as I hear you discuss how important it is in your interpretive approach to play this in a, in a rhythmically very strong way, I think there's another reinforcement of that idea, which is that Villalobos accents this upbeat eighth note B. If this section is done freely or is just arpeggiated so quickly, you cannot get the feeling of the power of that upbeat B and then its repetition with accents two other times in the next measure. Yes, you're right. But also that if you if you rush the arpeggio, then the the B, the accented B, comes in too early and uh, kind of uh, it spoils the the, the dance-like character. Yes. I think this is... I really appreciate these things that you're saying because now that people who, people who will listen to your discussion will have a whole new way of listening to performances of this music because everything, it seems to me, that in your approach to playing this music and in particular that we're discussing has to do with a very deep attention to the score and what the composer indicated rather than hearing someone else's performance we often hear performances that are like clones of other people's performances yes well i, I don't like to rely too much on traditions and uh, about this music, of course, there have been millions of performances, and it's very easily very easy to be influenced by some important players. My idea is to try to find my own way, uh, starting from the score, because we have a lot a lot of information there that is very useful to 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 decide how to interpret the piece. But of course, I I have some, I listen to some performance that have influenced me in some ways, but I always try to to, to find my, my, my way of, of playing the music. 
And basically, I always try to, to, to start from the score and uh, to consider all the details that we can find in the score. Um, I don't like to change uh, any details because I, I know that Villa Lobos was a guitar player, so he, he knew very well what he wanted to, to, to get. And uh, I want to understand, I try to, to figure out what he wanted from a player uh, before changing things. First, I have to understand. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Let's move ahead to the Mazurka Charo. And I'm going to do a screen share of a very early version. And here it's coming up. And now I'll do a close up because it's so fascinating to look at. Okay. So, Andrea, could you discuss? this version that looks to me like it's from 1911 am i reading that correctly i think so yes yeah. this is a very early version of the mazurka choro uh, it's called the uh, simple uh, mazurka there is no reference to the choro here and the theme is the same, of course, as the Mazurka Choro, and also the, the, the other sections, they are the same. But we have a four bar introduction here, which is not in the edition. And uh, there is no coda here. I mean, the, the finale with the, the triplets, those were added in the edition. Um, I think there was another manuscript by Villa Lobos, besides this one, a later manuscript, uh, which was more close to the printed edition. But there also, uh, there is no coda. So that was uh, probably a part that Villa Lobos added when he decided to publish the suite in the 50s. And in fact, uh, the, 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 I would say that the, the style is different. Uh, in the in the coda, we f we find the use of a parallel chords technique, which is something that is not very used in the suite, which is an early piece. Yes, I am just going to scroll down to the coda, which is. A very fascinating i think it's unique to to his work noticing that the chords are all in fourths rather than in thirds can you s share what your thinking is about why he might have added this coda in case you have any s special information and i don't have any any special information like we can only speculate about this mm -hmm. Well, he reworked the, the pieces for the edition, and he also reworked the, the suite uh, because in the in the first version of the suite, the, the some movements were different. Actually, there was a valse choro uh, that then Villa Lobos took out, uh, and this was recently rediscovered by Frederick Zigante in the Eshig archives. And so the, the whole piece was deeply reworked. And uh, about the mazurka, I have no idea. Probably Villa Lobos wanted to add some tension to the piece, to the final part of the piece. Also, the ending is very loud. It ends in the forte character, but the piece starts in a very melancholy, melancholic mood. So um, probably he was trying to, to, to to add a different shade of character to the piece in the last uh, part. Also, the rhythm is, is quicker. We have triplets, uh, and uh, the the notes are high. They, they go down very slowly. So it looks like he was trying to, 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 to add a kind of contrast in this section, 
Um, that's my idea. Mm. That that makes perfect sense, and so in in general, overall, I'm sure you have so many students that wish to play via Lobos, and what do you say or what do you think about a student who is beginning to learn one of the preludes or the etudes about them exploring the other music of a great composer like Villalobos, not just his guitar works, but perhaps his string quartets or his choral works or symphonic works and so forth? I think this is very important. Uh, I would suggest them to, to listen to other pieces by Villalobos. For instance, his orchestral music. It has always such a rich orchestrations and his sense of a color in his orchestrations in a way is a clue uh, for us uh, as how to approach his guitar music as well um, more imaginative and colorful attitude uh, there is so much music by villa lobos so it's <laughs> I've not listened to, to all of it, of course, uh, but I love the string quartets, for instance, those are beautiful. I love the Bacchianas Brasileiras. Uh, I've heard a lot of piano pieces by Villa Lobos, and every time I could find some relationship between these pieces and the guitar pieces in terms of character, sometimes in terms of melodic ideas, some themes that uh, there is there is one theme that we find, for instance, in the concerto, in the first movement of the concerto, uh, that Villa Lobos was kind of obsessed with. It's a beautiful theme. Uh, sometimes they use it in the minor version, sometimes in the major version. But you can listen to it in one of the Bacchianas Brasileiras, for instance. So it's always inspiring to listen to the music that some composers who wrote for the guitar uh, wrote for some other kind of instruments or combination of instruments. When you are teaching, you are teaching your students, your student, is there is a there first a piece by Villa Lobos that Lobos you suggest? Well, usually it's one of the preludes. Mm, I would say number number four. Uh, number four, number three, and number one are the easiest. So usually I start with those. Uh, number two and number five are more difficult, so later. One of the uh, people who is listening right now has posted a question, and I'll, I'll say to you, I think it's in the line of what we're discussing. Could you please ask Andrea to share with viewers some information about practice techniques and how exactly is a good way to go about learning one of the preludes, for example? That's a very big question. Those are two very big questions. But <laughs> just in general, how would you capsulize that? Well, first, I would suggest to, 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 to read the the piece throughout and get an idea of what it is like, get an idea of the character, uh, of the techniques involved. And then, well, of course, you have to decide about the fingerings, trying to understand how Villa Lobos. Uh, conceived the, the, the piece, so which kind of, in, for, let's say the first prelude, for instance, it's very important to understand that the line has to, to go on the same string, or in a way on, on the bass strings. Then you have to decide how to use the, the, the proper right hand technique to achieve this kind of a, uh, musical effect. And basically, once you have, you have the fingering and you got the, the, the character of the piece, then personally, I would, uh, I would play slowly 
trying to to uh, to improve each bar of the piece at the best of what I can before playing it to the right tempo before increasing the speed so what i suggest is always to to, to do a lot of uh, slow practice trying to read the music very carefully uh, i don't like to memorize music too early uh, i wanted to be sure that i remember all the details of the music that i'm playing and so the notes the dynamics the fingering uh, the articulation marking marks everything and it's easier to get to these if you practice slowly and of course reading in a very active way the score that's it basically that's my approach to nearly any kind of music actually yes now uh, this is this is a fantastic uh, and stimulating uh, discussion that you've helped everybody with regarding Via Lobos and also your approach to interpretation and technique and so forth. I was going to ask you what's happening with you in the near future as far as upcoming concerts or any recordings you're working on or recently have finished that you may wish to share with us. I have a few concerts uh, uh, coming up uh, in which I'm playing a, a program entirely dedicated to sonatas. And uh, the, the, the big pieces here are Soar's second sonata, Opus 25, and uh, Hans Werner Henze's first sonata from uh, Royal Winter Music Cycle. Uh, so it's quite a big program very mm, I, I love this music but i understand it's quite a difficult program also for, for the audience and uh, i like to do these kind of crazy things sometimes <laughs> and about recordings i finished a few months ago the recording of the complete uh, music for solo guitar by hans werner henze uh, this will be released uh, under Brilliant Classics label in May 2016. Mm, looking forward to that a lot. We're going to, as part of this interview, after it goes through a little bit of editing, particularly in uh, a gap where things uh, blanked out for a moment or so, this, I'm anticipating that our interview will be posted on YouTube and in it, there will be links to Andrea's website, his YouTube channel. I should say that all of his, um, the complete Via Lobos uh, works of the Etudes, Preludes, and the Suite Brazilian are all posted on YouTube. I think it's the very first time that we've ever had access to the complete works with one. Uh, one artist playing playing them. They're extremely, extremely wonderful performances, if I may say. And there's much to be enjoyed, but also learned and studied for those of you who are guitarists. So I do want to thank Andreas so much for visiting with us today and so generously sharing your time and your insights and approaches to this music it's it's been great to speak with you thanks jeffrey it was a big pleasure great so i will um uh, i will follow up with all of these things and down the road uh, we've we're beginning to plan it may not be for a while but we're beginning to plan a wonderful part two interview in which Andrea will be discussing the uh, Sor Mozart variations, the Bach Chacon, and the special work of the great Japanese composer Toro Takamitsu, which Andrea has also recorded his complete works for solo guitar. It's very, very, that will be also a very wonderful interview that we're looking forward to seeing down the line. So again, thank you all for joining us at Musicians Roundtable. And thank you, Andrea, again, for 
being with us today. It's been great. Thank you, Jeffrey.